I think one of the things that uh, Angela had asked me to, to do when she was putting the programme together with uh, NFF colleagues was uh, to perhaps put a bit of context behind uh, one where I was coming from, uh, where the smartest project comes from, and where we are with regard to flood resilience. And I think, uh, personally, one of my I, I was involved from about the mid-1990s in climate change in, impacts research. So we were looking at uh, NBRE in research uh, that looked at how a changing climate might impact on the buildings that we live in. Uh, build those then of course, uh, flood impacts comes very high on the list of uh, negative impacts. and. and uh, whereas you might argue that an increasing temperature may have uh, some positive benefits for energy performance, um, certainly with flood there's, there's very few uh, positives in regard to the current built environment. Um, around about the same time there was uh, flooding in, in Perth in Scotland um, uh, and as a result of that we were asked by what's called the Scottish Office at that time, uh, to, to produce a guide on flood resilient materials. Um, and that flood was quite significant because some in like 1,500 properties, a sizable proportion of, of, uh, of the area, uh, 1,200 of them being one council estate. Um, but that guidance actually read, led to a regulation in Scotland, building regulation, which has been in place uh, for quite a while now, um, although the extent of its impact is uh, perhaps a bit less easy to determine. Um, moving on a bit, we were involved in a DEFRA-funded innovation programme project with BRE, Backit Architects and a range of other consultants. Uh, and this was building on the kind of making space for water, which was the uh, the report Ian referred to the flooding foresight uh, report that was done uh, earlier and this has got a number of case studies about sustainable development and uh, making space for water or living with water uh, so it combines kind of uh, the, the idea that you you have to somehow uh, manage water and as a resource and manage it uh, as a flood risk uh, and indeed to, to live with it. And so there's upper, middle and lower catchment uh, examples there that have been developed. So uh, you probably actually get these documents um, free somewhere from the website, from the internet. Um, but the project Smartest that we're working on is, is really a, a, the latest in a a, a, a number of projects and initiatives that we've been involved with with University of Manchester and one of the most significant was the Cost Action C22 which is a research platform for sharing knowledge and research findings with uh, people around Europe or researchers around Europe ran for four years 2005 to 2009 uh, and uh, certainly the UK in the form of BRE <coughs> Manchester Uni, also Sheffield Uni as well, were, were to the fore in that, uh, in that cost action. And really that brought a lot of uh, knowledge together and some publications, books, conferences, uh, etc. Um, and it, it really was a springboard for the, uh, the development of the Smartest project. And one of the key things within that was the... Uh, was a kind of a recognition that there was a move from uh, flood defence to uh, a, a system of flood management or this would be necessary. Uh, so getting away from the old thinking where uh, really 2001 scenario where we think we've solved it and there's nothing else outside our, uh, our, our current interest until something happens. So traditional flood defence and moving towards uh, acceptance of uh, or risk, better understanding of risk 
and better communication of that risk. Um, and really, responsibility has been uh, taken not just by government, local authorities, but uh, as people say in Europe, the citizens. Um, so, in this kind of thinking was, was, was at the centre of the cost action, it's been at the centre of Smartest as well. And particularly, uh, people who, who led this, like Chris Zevenbergen from the Netherlands, Professor Eric Pasch from Germany, who's sadly no longer with us, uh, but we, these were innovative thinkers and their thinking affected uh, colleagues at Manchester Uni, at BRE, at Sheffield, and, and uh, with a range of research coming off the back of this cost action that's built around this kind of change in, uh, change in a view of the world. We've also got innovation, and innovation comes in uh, many forms, in the sort of technologies that we've uh, worked with uh, in the Smartest project, but it's also about information. So, uh, well, for example, uh, BRE Digest, which would be funded by the BRE Trust on flood resilience. So that's information to the construction industry primarily regarding flood risk, regarding how to build in a flood resilient manner. We have examples of uh, technologies such as the bottom left hand corner, the floating homes in the Netherlands. Uh, is a quite a niche thing, uh, but I did see a, a reference to someone wanting to build a, a floating passive home, so a very low energy uh, home in the UK. Um, and all these things have their place, uh, but certainly uh, innovation in tech, terms of technologies and how we bring technology to market uh, is, is one of the key things about the, the Smartest project. So Smartest um, project, we uh, came out, all the, the, the partners uh, came out of the, the cost action. We responded to a, a call that's funded by the European Union Commission through the Framework 7 programme. I uh, started in, in January 2010 and we're almost going to get rid of it, perhaps this month, perhaps in a month or two's time. Um, so three and a half years of research uh, going on around the 10 organisations in Europe. Um, and I think it it's, wasn't so much a project that came out just of the flood management arena, but it was also about environmental technologies. So this idea of uh, getting new technologies and innovation to the marketplace was one of the, the key things that European Union and the Commission were looking for and therefore uh, the project came about. Well, we've seen these before, the, the 10 key organisations and plus our colleagues in the United States who've, who've assisted there. So building on a, a number of years together, I think in the beginning with regards to what we refer to as flood resilience technologies, there was a number of barriers to, to their use and, and really uh, the degree of acceptance amongst private, public professionals uh, and others um, was, was variable at best and, and clearly there, the, the, there are issues uh, and some of that comes down to uh, lack of the, the right information um, but also comes down to the way in which we communicate, the way in which we procure technologies uh, and uh, perhaps we're it's an area, it's a, it's a fairly small sector populated by innovative uh, but not well funded companies uh, so it's difficult to get new innovation to build on the last generation or the last uh, uh, version of a product uh, to answer some of these, these issues. So that was one of the things that the project looked at. So. Ian's already gone, gone through some of these things, but I think you, some of the important things are about raising awareness and dissemination of good practice uh, and setting an environment for innovation were all things that were project was, was about. Um, and it, it's interesting that, that uh, we have a range of countries involved in this, some from Southern Europe, some others from called North or West Europe. Um, and certainly the UK is, is quite clear to me as, as, 
uh, is advanced in, in the area of flood resilience technologies as, as any country. Some are, there's very little market penetration or development and very little thinking about uh, the, the role of these technologies and, and, and how they could uh, play a part in flood management. UK, certain things have been drivers that have helped us to take us, take us along. Other countries, we see uh, perhaps their, their focus is on um, uh, different t technologies to our own. I think here, property level protection, smaller aperture products have tended to come to the, the fore in the market. Uh, and when you see the, the surface water risk, you can understand that because it's it's difficult to manage that surface water risk with larger uh, infrastructure barriers, etc. But other countries have much greater risk, Central and Eastern European countries, river floods, uh, etc. Uh, we've, we've learned from our colleagues in Germany that a flood there can submerge a, a six metre building. Now, thankfully, we don't get too many floods of that dimension in this country, but we do get a lot of regular surface water floods uh, that, that cause significant damage and disruption. So technologies, we're looking at aperture technologies or property level uh, technologies, different versions of them, some of them pre-installed automatic uh, air bricks, for example, uh, flood doors, demountable ones that we're, we're familiar with. Uh, in terms of uh, putting a, a, a guard on a door, etc., a board on a door, or an, an air brick cover into place. Um, perimeter technologies come in various uh, shapes, sizes, and types. And again, it's the context in which you're using that, that that's, uh, that, that's important. Uh, what sort of management and operational uh, procedures and, and practices do you have in place. At this level, you're generally looking at a, uh, you're above a household or it may be manageable by a community, but it may be that it's a local authority uh, or other authority, a private uh, developer, property owner, a larger portfolio holder who, who has to manage this. It physically has to send people out to put things in place. So what's the logistics of that? Uh, and although the, the guides that we're launching today are kind of more around the aperture type level, those principles, those six steps can equally apply to uh, perimeter technologies. We also looked at building technologies themselves and the resilience of the, the, the building. Um, and uh, it, it's quite clear that the less damage you can cause or you, you can have by water entering a building, the quicker you can clean it up, get the water out, dry out, decontaminate, uh, and get back to, to life again, then the, the, the better. Um, for too long, we hear of people being out of their homes or businesses being ruined. Uh, as a result of flooding. So there's many things that we can do uh, with regard to technologies, either to keep water out of buildings or if it does go in, uh, that, that we, we manage that in a way through the materials, the d design, the form of constructions that we, we use. So again, this has been part of the, the project. We've done a lot of... Uh, Testing, particularly our, our colleagues over in Hamburg in Germany have very large scale uh, test tanks, so they've been able to test these uh, different perimeter uh, infrastructure type barriers. Um, so one in the top left hand corner, we uh, worked with uh, Tilt Dam in the UK and we had uh, sample sections manufactured and shipped out to Germany to test. And um, that is. It, it, the particular product we were testing had a, an innovation there that allowed that, that technology to be put into place faster by less people uh, in the event of a, a flood warning or a flood event about to come. And it performed very well in those, those series of tests. So 
but different types of technologies. Um, you see there, there's piles of sandbags. I do argue with our colleagues in Germany as to whether we should have them, but in fact, the, uh, the, 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 the particular process they had here was, was quite interesting, but um, clearly the project is about moving away from reliance on that types of technology and, and to uh, innovative ways, uh, ones that perform well. So our tests have to be demanding uh, on the looking at hydrostatic tests, hydrodynamic tests um, that replicate the sort of conditions that are found in, in practice. We already have a, a BSI pass for, uh, for these types of technologies, perimeter, aperture, barriers, etc. Um, no one else in Europe has anything near to a national standard for flood resilience technologies of this type. Um, and one of our first aims, objectives of the project was to try to harmonise testing and harmonise its approach, approaches to certification. But when you don't actually have national standards, it's difficult to harmonise things. So one of the things that will be, uh, one of the pieces of guidance that we're putting out is really for standards makers, so at national body level and at, at the European standards level on uh, what the technologies are, how they work, where they should be put, etc. Uh, related to testing, but also related to the code of practice, uh, which itself is related to the, the six steps that we're discussing this morning. Developed some tests again, uh, some at BRE, some in, in, uh, in Dresden in Germany, looking at the resilience of building materials, understanding how materials perform under the uh, action of water, uh, etc. Now, you know, as an organisation, BRE has been doing, been throwing water at building materials for the best part of 90 years, so we know a bit about it, but. Why then do we have situations where we get so much damage in a flood situation, uh, it takes so long to dry, decontaminate, etc. Uh, so again, if you go to any uh, standard for any type of uh, building product, there is no reference to its flood resilience. Uh, and it's difficult to define a specific property of a material that you could say is, is relevant to flood resilience. Uh, there's a range of things, a range of things that we have to, to look at there. So again, the project's been about providing that, that guidance and advice to the standards makers. I think the, we're also not just about the technologies itself, it's the context in which they're put there, the decision-making processes, uh, even as something is simple as a, a single property uh, and putting in a range of property level protection. Um, it shouldn't really be thought of in isolation from its surroundings, whether that's a, a rural or urban setting. Um, but, you know, are we passing on the risk or the, the impact of the flooding from one person to another uh, by taking certain measures? Uh, so. Within the project, we've been developing a, a range of tools, damage uh, tools, which allow us to model the benefit of using technologies. Uh, surface water models allow us to show where uh, water moves and the, the impact of putting barriers into it, to the way decision-making tools, etc. And this will be available in a, 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 a set of tools, a, a, a toolkit, basically. Um, now. What we're not saying is that we've come up with a model here that can show you the, the cost benefit of using certain types of technologies. That's all you, that's all you should ever use. That's not the case. Uh, we've, shown, we've developed a range of tools here that demonstrate cost benefits uh, can be practically uh, used for, to help decision makers. But there's many tools out there for, for uh, uh, flood modeling, etc. But it's important that the decision you make on the technologies that you use are based on a, a good method of getting to that decision. Uh, so 
Some of these would be expensive to run. Some of them would be fairly straightforward, fairly cheap. So, uh, but it's important that we take decisions on that basis and understand the system that we, uh, we put the technology into. Uh, what's the nature of the flood risk? Um, what's the impact going to be? And uh, if we start to, uh, to, to think of technologies that could help us to manage the risk to the buildings, infrastructure, etc., then uh, uh, what's the benefit and what could be the downside, the risks involved? Of course, the, the system that we, uh, that we place it into, some areas will be covered with flood warning systems, for example. So you could consider linking that flood warning to taking certain actions using certain types of technologies. If it's not, maybe we have to think differently about the type of technology to use. And again, this li links into the, to the six steps approach that we have. Okay, um, you can find out more about the project and hopefully in about a month's time we'll have all our final del deliverables, our guidance documents on technologies, on the toolkit, on uh, systems guidance on the website floodresilience.eu. Um, I think the, the guides that we're, we're launching today address the concerns that have previously been held by, by people and hopefully it helps to, uh, the route to market as we, we get that information out there. There's a range of places that we can go from here. Um, technology standards at the EU level, that will take a number of years to come. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the contacts that we've had at, at the European standardisation bodies, um, at least there's the be beginning of, of some knowledge there and uh, maybe the European standard have to be developed from the top down rather than the normal approach of bottom up. Um, I think better risk or better communication of risk and responsibilities uh, is, is quite key. Uh, there is a move to, uh, to devolve responsibility uh, downwards and that comes with, com comes with some risk and uh, transfer of risk as well. I think we have to, to look at uh, flood zones, tool systems, technologies as being non-structural measures that can be legitimately used in flood management. Um, and I think, again, Going back to one of the earlier slides, the move from traditional flood defence thinking. I think we need better demonstration as well. Uh, there's lots of good examples from companies, from other organisations around, but um, we're really just scratching the surface of that. Uh, so I think research to demonstration should be showing good examples, not just of the different types of technologies or flood resilient buildings, but the decision making processes the costs, the benefits, etc., that, that arise from that. Um, construction skills, I think, have to develop in this area. Uh, I don't think you'll find many NVQs on uh, flood resilience for builders at the moment, uh, but with regard to the built environment and infrastructure, they're absolutely key. That's the direction we have to travel in. And of course, the old uh, issue of building regulation and uh, that is one of the few pit report recommendations not to have been taken up by government. Uh, and I don't think that should be forgotten about. Uh, it, it clearly has a role and uh, should be addressed again. Thank you very much. <laughs>